Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. This morning's guest that we have with us is Laura Matter. She is the um, one of the um, amazing um, Garden Hotline educators and has a plethora of information and expertise to share with us this lovely morning. Thank you so much, Laura, for being here with us. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. We had like about five different things we had to solve. <laughs> Usually it's just Indeed. one, and this time it was more. Um, we're going to talk about what you can be doing in the garden right now, uh, the things to be thinking about to get your garden uh, put to bed, to set, be set up for spring, or to get some new things um, planted in it now. Uh, fall is a great time for planting and, and we'll go through that. Uh, we're going to do start with a little introduction about um, the climate and um, how light works in the garden, just so, sort of some gardening basics. So on the next slide, we're going to see a little map of the maritime northwest climate, um, looking at the different geological features around western Washington. Um, Puget Sound mitigates our, our weather quite a bit, um, but it varies depending on where you are, which side of the sound, up north or south. Uh, it gets quite a bit colder as you get down in towards Chehalis and where all the prairie lands are, um, and it's uh, warmer and there's this wonderful rain shadow effect that happens up in the San Juan Islands. Um, for those of us who live in the Cascade foothills, uh, so people in East King County, encounter this. It gets colder, faster, they have earlier frosts. So wherever you are, um, your climate's going to be slightly different than your neighbors uh, to the north or south or east uh, west of you. Um, so getting to know what happens in your neck of the woods is important. Uh, those of us here like Seattle down to Federal Way area, we're on Puget Sound. That has a huge effect on our climate, keeps us warmer, keeps us cooler. Um, you know, climate change is real, and so we are seeing differences in that. We certainly have had a hot, dry summer this year, um, and we had a long, cold, wet spring, so that affected how things grew for us, um, and it affects how things are looking right now and what we should be doing. So in the next slide, we're talking about light. Um, light comes um, uh, at different times of year comes to us in different ways. So it's much lower on the horizon in the winter time and high in the summer because of our latitude and where we are on the planet. Um, we encounter very long days in the summer and shorter days in the winter and um, this affects how our plants grow as well. So being aware of how those how the light changes seasonally matters to what you plant and how you take care of it. And then understanding what's around you and your environment. If you're in urban spaces, you might have built big buildings next to you. Uh, you could have big trees that uh, potentially shade your property, depending on which side of the house they're on. Uh, but lots of things can affect light, including even reflection. Um, the picture you're seeing here is of the Issaquah Pickering um, Farm uh, Garden, which is uh, where they do the farmer's market and it's across from Costco, if you guys have ever been out there. Um, this big uh, metal um, cistern is very reflective and actually just brightens up the areas right around it. Um, Tilth Alliance used to take care of this side of the garden and we had a big vegetable garden over there. And you could tell when you were working in this garden how that um, structure affected different plants around it. It would make things brighter for it. This can even happen with light colored sidewalks. So when new sidewalks go in, sometimes those really white sidewalks can and cause a lot more light uh, reflection on plants. So keeping that in mind, that's helpful to know, um, especially in the winter where your light is because you wanna continue to grow things, it's important that especially if you're looking at vegetables that you have a sunny space to continue to grow overwintering veggies. And the next one. So temperature in the garden can vary 
<clears throat> as I mentioned with looking at the geological features of Puget Sound area, you know, um, we have different temperature gradients depending on where you live, but this can also happen in a microclimate sense right in your garden. And so you could have a pond in the garden that can help warm the air up around it. Um, it can cause more humidity. You could have uh, a lot of brick or stone, things that absorb heat, that radiate heat back out at night, which would keep the temperature a little higher around plants at night. Uh, you could have more trees, even large plant groupings can affect um, temperature. I used to live in Northeast Seattle in a house that had a lot of large conifers and shade. And um, I had a little tiny lawn uh, in one area in the front of the garden that was um, sunny enough to, to have a lawn. And it was the only place I had it everywhere else was just sort of a woodland garden. My neighbors to the west of me had wide open lawns, no trees, no shrubs, nothing in their front yards. And their lawns in the winter would get covered in frost when it was cold. And my lawn would not unless it was really cold. So the trees around that little piece of lawn sheltered and warmed up, especially if you have conifers. Evergreen plants continue to photosynthesize through the winter. And so they are letting off heat. And these can be um, things that you, um, can take advantage of as you're um, trying to plan what you're planting and how your uh, garden is growing. Wind also, of course, affects plants. It, they dry them out and they can cool them off as well. And um, so they use more water when they're in windy situations. So to manage these microclimates, um, just think about what it is you want to grow and what you can benefit from. If you have a brick foundation on your house or brick facing, or you have lots of big rocks in the garden, you could put plants there that need a little more heat. Um, they can benefit from that in the summertime as well as in the winter. And um, think about where the sun moves in your garden so that you can do um, successional plantings of things. You could, for instance, have a big tree that is bare all winter long, like a big, big leaf maple that's really huge. You could grow things under it that are um, gonna be transitional that come up and bloom and then die back. Things like bleeding heart, for instance, which doesn't always keep its foliage all summer long. Um, that will thrive in an area like that because then it gets shadier as the sun gets brighter, which it appreciates. You can create wind barriers by how you place plants. Um, think about the eaves of your house that those are sheltered areas, but also remember that in the winter time, if you have something evergreen there or something that's going to need watering, you need to maybe supplement that water. Um, so if you have your water shut off outside, you're going to have to, you know, get a watering bucket and carry water out to it if it stays dry, because things under the eaves aren't going to get the rain. Uh, remember that cold air settles. So the picture that you're looking at is a foggy day in the fall at Picardo Farm Pea Patch in Northeast Seattle that is in this um, lower area off the street. It was an old bog that was drained by the Picardo family um, in the 1920s. And they farmed there for many years and took their produce down to Pike Place Market. Uh, in the 60s, they gave up that area and that became a pea patch. It was the first pea patch in the city system, city of Seattle system but it's low off the street. So you walk down into the garden and because of that, it gets earlier frosts and later frosts than other um, parts of the neighborhood, just right around it, even literally right next door. Um, you can use cold cloches and cold frames as well. Um, so let's take a look at that. Oh, I don't have that slide in here. Well, so cold, let me just go over that. So cloches are um, temporary structures that you put up usually with um, rounded um, piping that makes a tent over your plantings. And this is really useful for edible gardens so that you can um, extend the season uh, for things that are tender. Many things will grow long-term over the season, uh, over the winter in, in the Pacific Northwest. But for those that can't, you can get your eek out a little bit more warmth by having those cloches on, you can put them out earlier in the spring and get um, the soil warmed up faster. 
And then the, um, the big frames, uh, a lot of farmers use the big ones, the high tunnels uh, to grow things in because it actually makes a difference even if they're open on the ends. So soil, soil is always important. It's something we should be thinking about year round and taking care of. Um, we tend to not pay attention to the fact that uh, there is life underneath our feet. We think about it as something that we walk on. Um, you know, we call it dirt. We don't um, always really realize how important the life in the soil is. So you need to understand about soil that it's, it's um, partially alive and also it, it has mineral content and organic matter that's dead material. So soil health can make or break plant success. If you don't have healthy soil, if you don't have well draining soil, if you don't have nutritious soil, uh, you're not going to have healthy plants unless you have a plant that thrives on, you know, sort of barren spaces or doesn't mind having its uh, roots wet. Um, but those are fewer plants than what we typically grow. So it's important to get to know your soil type. And um, generally that means that it's either very clay, very sandy or somewhere in between. The ideal soil to grow things in is a loamy soil, which is a mixture of those two. And it has a lot of organic matter in it. Um, it's important to test your soil, especially in uh, the southern parts of, uh, southwest parts of King County, where the Asarco smelter um, had effects on soil. Um, and then to amend your soil, whether it's really sandy or really clay, you want to add compost to it. Compost is really sort of the, um, the neutralizing agent that helps to keep soil from getting too dry or from staying too wet. It, it can actually break up clay soil and it can fill in where sandy soil has very large pores and lets water move through it. Um, this quote from Wendell Berry, who is an agronomist and uh, philosopher, really, who has been working with farms for years, um, what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. He's speaking about protecting soil. And so it's important for us, even in urban areas, even if all you're growing is, you know, shrubs and um, trees in your yard, um, to protect soil um, for many reasons. Next. One of the ways you can protect soil is with mulch. And so this is a great time of year to start thinking about getting mulch on your garden if you don't do it right now, even now up until November um, is plenty of time to start working on this. The sooner you do this, um, as soon as the, the weather cools down a bit, you know, we're supposed to be in for a hot day today, but as the weather cools, those cool season weeds like to pop back up, the ones we see a lot in spring the annuals that have millions of seeds in them and then they go to seed and now you have millions more weeds in your garden. If you put mulch down now or soon, you can prevent those from germinating because you're inhibiting those um, little seeds that are in the soil. A lot of annual seeds are um, triggered to grow, to germinate by a flash of light when you are digging in the garden or weeding in the garden or raking or um, hoeing even. And so if you are going to do that kind of work, if you're hoeing your garden or you're pulling some weeds, it's always helpful to throw some mulch over the soil after you do that because you have let light in and those weed seeds are triggered by far red light that comes from the sun. They get that light, it triggers them to grow and now you have more weeds. So in some ways, when we do our work, we're, we're encouraging things to grow. That's kind of the process of nature. Um, but we have tricks like throwing mulch on the soil to help uh, mitigate that. Um, mulch also protects soil from nutrient loss. So we get a lot of heavy rains throughout the winter season. And those rains um, build up, they pull nutrients down deeper into the soil. Uh, sometimes those nutrients wash out of the soil into local streams and creeks and rivers and end up in Puget Sound. Um, so putting um, mulch on will actually break up the raindrops. It will help absorb some of that rain so that there isn't this overabundance of uh, water that's moving out of the soil. 
and it keeps the nutrients in the upper soil levels where the plant roots can access them. It protects soil from compaction, which is really important. Those heavy rains can are really heavy. You know, they're big raindrops and mulch actually can break up those raindrops. And so then it isn't hitting the ground quite as hard and it's not hitting the soil directly. You don't wanna forget about potted plants. If you have very large ones, they can benefit from a, um, a very thin layer of mulch put in them. You wanna be careful with woody plants and pots that you don't bury the stems in mulch, but it isn't, doesn't hurt to put some on top of the soil. When you're growing veggies in the garden, it matters what kind of mulch you use. Light uh, mulch is good around plants that you want to reflect heat from and dark colored mulch, which absorbs more heat, are great for um, uh, our hot weather crops like tomatoes and peppers and things like that. And then this is the time of year our leaves are going to start falling. I know big leaf maples have been pretty challenged this year. It's been very dry. They got powdery mildew on them very early. Uh, those leaves are falling. In my backyard, uh, there's one that sort of straddles my neighbor's house uh, to the north and our house. And those leaves are already drying and falling um, just from stress. But the natural senescence, which is when leaves um, get hormonal changes and they, the little stem then loses its grips essentially on the, on the plant um, and all the leaves start dropping. That's gonna happen real soon and it can happen over a period of months. Um, and collecting those leaves, as long as they're not diseased or uh, insect ridden, can be really helpful to keep on site. Um, composting things that um, have insects can, can help. They're not gonna live over, typically those are aphids. So you can compost those leaves and the aphids die out as it gets too cold anyway. Um, so think about keeping your leaves, think about sharing your leaves. Some people, you know, give leaves to their neighbors that don't have trees because they have an overabundance of leaves and um, getting them out of the streets too, if you live in urban areas where there's storm drains is really important to, to keep the storm drains open. Um, if they haven't been laying in the street very long, they're still useful. Um, those are often better to send off to commercial composting because sometimes they have like oil and gas mix um, in them and maybe heavy metals from uh, things coming off cars and tires. Even bicycles um, can um, have heavy metals from their brake pads and that kind of thing that end up in the street. You can store fall leaves. You have too many. You can put them in big plastic bags or the, if you have a dry space, you can put them in those paper yard waste bags and they sort of break down over the winter and then you have them later to use as mulch. But you can also get free wood chips from arborists um, so that they're not having to take them to the transfer stations and to the clean green and, and uh, dump them. So next. So here's some ideas of types of mulch, wood chips, which I just mentioned. These are great to put around perennial plantings, tree and shrub beds, great for ground covers, they're good for pathways especially. Uh, a lot of people create, you know, uh, gardens with wood chip paths going through them, easy to reapply, um, help to keep the weeds down, but also are nutritious. And the difference between wood chips and bark is, is a lot. Bark is the bark of the tree, it's the outer layer. By nature, its job is to shed water and it's not, it doesn't have any nutrition in it. Um, and, it, and it helps to protect the trees um, and shrubs from getting diseases. So it has repellent qualities and it doesn't have a lot of nutrition, whereas wood chips is, it, they are much more nutritious. They are part of the live tree that's been cut. Um, sometimes it's dead wood, but they, there's much more uh, nutritive quality in that and it breaks down over time. So bark, if you do use bark, you know, pathways are a good place to use that because you're not really interested in improving the soil underneath it as much. Um, compost is a great addition for vegetable gardens or annual beds where you have annual flowers um, or, or on your, some of your potted plants, things like that. Uh, this has a lot more nutrition in it. It's not going to keep weeds down as efficiently as other types of mulch. Um, and then leaves um, are good for all of the above uses. Uh, leaves can be um, run over with a lawnmower to, to chop them up to make them smaller and, and uh, not so they won't mat up as much. 
and um, can be used in any kind of setting that you have. Um, there's lots of mulch you can buy. A lot of the commercial mixes are manure and wood products. So like Stierco or um, what is the one? There's one out in Woodenville. I can't remember the name of now, uh, but they're basically either wood chip and different kinds of animal, animal manures or their um, sawdust and manure mixes. And those are good. Uh, they can tend to, the sawdust and manure blends can tend to cake up over time and sometimes you have to loosen those up, but they look nice. They look more natural like soil and some people don't like the look of wood chips. So looking for something like that, if you don't like wood chips, this is a good alternative. Burlap is great for vegetable beds or open bed areas. Um, it does, it's not something you're going to want to, you know, let decay into the soil because the strings take forever to break down and, and it's hard to work in a bed that has, you know, burlap sort of mixed into it, but it's intended for a cover over the top of things, in particular vegetable beds in the winter time that you're not growing food in. You could put leaves underneath them that you've gathered in your yard and then throw burlap over it and that makes a nice combination. Um, to help protect the soil in your vegetable beds. Sheet mulching is cardboard and um, materials underneath. You could put it directly over weeds. You could pull weeds and throw them down and put it, um, put the sheet mulch over it. Uh, cardboard or newspaper. Of course, we don't have as much newspaper these days, but cardboard works really well. You wanna overlap the edges. And this is good for where you're trying to build soil or you're trying to prepare a bed. So for instance, if you're gonna put a veggie garden in, next spring and you want to pre prepare a section of your lawn, you don't have to dig it up. You can just simply sheet mulch it with cardboard. And then um, <clears throat> you could put compost underneath if you wanted to, or those leaves in your yard and put the cardboard over the top and just let it sit for the winter. And then by spring, it will have decayed, killed the grass underneath and you have less digging to do. So much easier, um, especially for sod removal. And then cover crops, which you see in the bottom picture, <clears throat> These are um, special seeds that are grain or pea family plants, um, so grasses and peas, and they grow over the winter and they protect soil in all the ways that mulch does um, from compaction, from loss of nutrient. Uh, they also have roots that open up the soil so they can help break up soil just by virtue of growing. And then you dig them in in the spring and those, um, that helps to break up the soil. And it also adds nutrient to the soil. So lots of nutrition, especially in the form of nitrogen. <clears throat> nitrogen um, can just deplete very fast as you're growing, heavily growing in areas. And so, especially in vegetable gardens, this is a really useful tool to help build nutrition and get them ready for spring planting. The cereal grains are things like, um, uh, annual rye, you don't want to put perennial grasses in here. You want to put annual plants that would go through one season. You want to get them before they bloom so that you're not have, you don't have more seeds in the soil that will continue to try to grow. You turn it under and you let it sit for a week or so. And then that breaks down and adds all that nutrition back. Pea family plants have a specialized root nodule, which actually helps to, um, add more nitrogen. It, it brings nitrogen from the air into the plant and it helps to transform it into nitrogen that's useful for plants. So next. Um, here's the sheet mulching method in practice. This is also uh, over at Picardo Farm. I gardened there for many years, so I have a lot of pictures from there. And what they were doing here is putting some cardboard and some sheet mulch down around blueberries. So they're putting it in a bed that's established with plants already, but they're trying to get rid of all the weeds that keep trying to grow in this bed. And this was being done in the fall um, so that they, it could look, uh, they could keep the weeds down for the winter. <coughs> you wanna um, make sure that you're using only organic, not organic in the sense of certified organic, but organic in the sense of something that's gonna break down and work into the soil. Um, so the, the carbon, in the paper and the cardboard actually helps uh, and, and breaks down and becomes part of the soil as well. Um, so that's just an example of how that works. Next. Um, here's a picture of some cover crops. This is mostly pea family plants in this photo. 
Uh, the crimson clover that you see blooming is something that blooms a little bit later, but you can let pea family plants go through to the phase of blooming because they are really good for pollinators, early pollinators that are out flying around and they're very pretty. And often, um, you know, it looks, it looks nice in the garden to let them bloom and you're not ready to turn it under yet. So you can let those go and uh, just don't let the grasses go because they're harder to deal with. Uh, you wanna plant it soon from late September through early November for best results. Things like um, cayuse oats and the, um, the rye um, can be planted into mid-November. I've done it as late as November 15th and had good success, but you'll find that the pea family, especially this crimson clover, will not germinate in cold soils, so you need to do it earlier. So if you're invested in that, do that soon. Um, they should, all these things should be available at local nurseries and different sites right now. And I don't know, um, Elizabeth, if Marlene sells cover crops, but if you don't, you should um, for people to buy. Um, but this again, does all the things that are useful for um, protecting soil and um, really wonderful way to protect your soil over the winter with living, living cover. Next. So as I said earlier, planting in the fall is really optimal. Uh, we tend to do most of our planting in the spring because plants are starting to grow, they look beautiful, they're easy to sell at nurseries. Uh, nurseries do know though, most Northwest nurseries are pretty um, uh, aware of fall planting being a healthier time to plant things. And so often they have sales um, where they bring in plants specifically for planting. Um, things are starting, deciduous things are starting to lose their leaves. So, you know, you don't get that benefit of having this beautiful, you know, tree all leafed out. But what you are doing is establishing this root system that's going to enable the plant to be even stronger. So because they're going dormant, they are putting their energy into growing roots and roots, are what our soil stays warm for a little while, and so roots continue to grow for a while. And so through the fall, you put them in warm soils, roots grow, and it rains, and you don't have to water as much. You get a better plant um, next spring when it starts to grow. It's not trying to put a root system out and a leaf system out. It's already established its root system. So fall is great. Um, there's less stress too when you're planting. So if you're planting when it's warmer, plants are, you know, they don't have their roots established and they depend on water movement up and down the, the plant. It's a hydraulic system of moving water and nutrients up and down. And when they don't have a good root system, they're depending on the reserves in the plant. And so then they don't grow as well um, when they're trying to leaf out. Um, so it's also a really good time to be looking at what worked in your garden and what didn't. And so it's a nice time to make decisions about that. Um, there's also lots of vegetables you could be uh, putting in right now still. Um, some of them are really short season. We're kind of past the point of doing too many things that would take a couple months to come to harvest. But uh, if you put a cloche out, you could set lettuce plants out. You could buy plants that are already ready. And you could also be putting in things that will winter over, like anything in the broccoli, cabbage, uh, cauliflower family. Next. Um, this is a great time to, to assess how your pests and disease uh, management went for the year and what plants you saw that were troubled the most and, and really think about, was that because this was a hard um, you know, weather system for them this year? Uh, some things we saw powdery mildew on those maples early because we had this long, cold, wet spring in, all the way into June. And it, as it started to warm up, it was still raining. And so we ended up with these conditions that are perfect for um, powdery mildew to uh, proliferate on plants. Uh, so, you know, looking at which plants were most effective, uh, you can make decisions about whether you want to continue to try to manage that or whether you want to choose something that has more resistance to the disease or insect that you saw. You also want to make sure that we're choosing plants that are for the right climate. Um, so 
plants that used to do really well in Western Washington, there are there is some shifting going on. We're seeing that plants that come from, you know, California or Southern Oregon sometimes are going to become more well adapted here. And there are a lot of experience experiments going on in the Northwest where they're trying cultivars of some of the um, things like Douglas fir that have uh, grown in warmer climates to see if they'll be more adaptable here over time. Um, you wanna practice tolerance though. So if you just have a few spots on something, that's usually not something to worry about. Um, there's lots of ways to manage things. We get a lot of calls on the hotline later in the summer about uh, yellow leaves on tomatoes or drying up leaves. And that's usually on the base of the plant. And so those aren't things to worry about. That's natural progression. The plant is trying to bloom and, and flower, and so it's letting go of some of its leaves. So understanding, you know, what, what are the things you need to worry about and what don't you need to worry about? And then if you are going to use a treatment, um, look at the safer pesticides, uh, the, soil, the, the soap and oil formulations, uh, but even realize that even those can harm, your, they can harm your plant if you spray on a hot sunny day but they can also harm beneficial insects who also lay their eggs on the same plants that the plant eating insects do because that's where their food is. And so you wanna become familiar uh, as well with those, uh, those beneficial insects, what their eggs look like, what their larvae look like so that you aren't harming them as well. Next. So when you're watering this time of year, when you're planting, it's still dry. Um, you know, we had a little sprinkle recently, uh, but obviously we're getting hot weather right now. It's going to cool off, but that doesn't mean we're going to have enough rain to sustain newly planted plants. So you want to make sure that you pre-water the soil before you plant. Make sure it's well saturated. And sometimes it takes a few water and soil that dries out gets hydrophobic, doesn't accept water as easily. So dig your planting hole, fill it with water, let it drain out the um, the soil that you're gonna mix back in, add some fresh compost or add some fresh soil to that, and then um, mulch around it with compost as well. It's important to make sure that your planting beds aren't, you don't have like super nutritious growing holes and pockets, that the whole bed is nutritious so that the plant roots can move out into the entire bed and, and get where they need to go. Um, but it can take up to two years for a plant to become established, which means you have to give it regular water during the summer. Um, and perennials can take up to a year. Um, so, you know, that's why fall is helpful because you can, you can um, get through part of the season uh, quick, more quickly because you're putting it in during the rainy uh, season. And then again, add mulch. And then one real, you know, um, good rule of watering is to water in the morning if you can and always water at the base of the plant to reduce evaporation and disease issues. Now, that being said, sometimes when it's really hot, it's helpful to have an overhead sprinkler on plants just to cool things down, but do it at a time of day, like in the morning when plants can dry off. Other than powdery mildew, which actually is inhibited by water on the leaves, most disease organisms proliferate when you have wet leaves, especially as you go into the night um, in cooler temperatures. So next. Um, there are a lot of um, things to be thinking about as far as stormwater goes too. Uh, right now is a good time to actually put in a rain garden before the rains come. You want to do it while things are dry, um, partly so you can really test. You want to test your soil to see how well it drains. Uh, there's no sense putting a rain garden in somewhere where water doesn't drain out quickly uh, because ideally it's supposed to drain in a day. And the purpose of a rain garden is to take water off a roof, um, put it through a rain garden, put it into a cistern. These stormwater projects are aimed at slowing water down that's going into storm drains. In Seattle, we have combined sewers, so it's really a problem because if the storm drain overflows, it means it takes sewage out into the waterways around us. And um, as Seattle Public Utilities has RainWise program uh, that is aimed at helping people build rain gardens and put cisterns in. There are um, other projects. Uh, 12,000 Rain Gardens uh, website has different um, 
cities that do different projects um, that help with stormwater and then some King County funding that you can get to help and also can help with planting trees in, in your property. So it's important to think about what can you do to help slow stormwater down, especially what's coming off our roofs, which is a lot of rainfall, hits the roof, goes into um, pipes down into the um, storm drains and slowing that down can be helpful for the waters around us. Next. So here are all the things you can plant. You can do trees and shrubs, perennials. Uh, there's a lot of things to do for seasonal color right now. So spring um, blooming bulbs, those of you who you know, like bulbs probably already have seed or have catalogs um, you know, in your house. I you know I've been getting them. Uh, pansies are available in the nurseries now, chrysanthemums. Um, chrysanthemums are fun. They're perennial plants. You take care of them properly. You can have them from year to year. Um, overwintering veggies. So as I said, this is a great time to be planting things like cabbages and broccolis and cauliflowers, collards, kale, uh, all of those things, kohlrabi. They're, they're super hardy. They overwinter just fine. Um, you can be putting um, things in the onion family in now. You can even be putting in some like green onions for a while, uh, just seed even, and you get a few green onions through the fall. Leeks will overwinter. Garlic uh, fall, October is the best time to plant them. They're going to stay in your garden until June, July when you harvest. And then you can also plant snow peas right now. So they will overwinter. In fact, I tend to try to do this because I get really busy in the spring with my work and I never get my peas planted in time. So I've been planting them in the fall and they will overwinter and then I get a crop a little bit earlier than I would if I had planted them in March. Um, if you have the cloching system, you can do the softer leaf uh, varieties like lettuce, chard, and spinach, and then onions will last longer in the garden. Think about when you're planting, what can you put in that will attract wildlife to the garden, especially things that will attract, um, protect hummingbirds. Um, we, I know hummingbirds live over in the Northwest. They stay around all year long. And so having things that bloom really early are really useful. Uh, rosemary is one of the earlier blooming things in my garden. So it seems funny because we think of that as, you know, a hot weather type of plant. It's a, it's a woody shrub. They get those little tiny blue flowers on them. They love them. I see hummingbirds all over my rosemaries in the wintertime. Other things that are good for them um, are, are um, you know, many native plants uh, that will be helpful to them. Things like the red flowering um, currant. Um, Mahonia or Oregon grape, things like that. And then think about making sure you have plants in the mint, aster, and carrot families. This is not hard to do. These are many of our um, herb and flower plants that we um, supplement in our garden, especially around our vegetable garden. But these are really strong attractants for pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, now, of course, is the time to put in a new lawn. Well, not now exactly. It's a little hot, but as it cools off, Grass is a cool weather crop. So whether you're seeding or sodding, putting a new sod lawn in, now um, is the time to be thinking about getting that going. Okay, next. So native fauna recognize native flora. They do know, um, you know, some of the plants that have been around a long time in the Northwest they are familiar with and will make use of, but they are going to definitely um, be attracted to things that, that are things that they co-evolved with. So things like the Oregon grape that you see in this picture have very early um, yellow flowers. They have fruit that ripens later that other birds will eat as well. Um, but this is really great food for Anna and some birds. Um, wildlife will become familiar with your landscape if you create habitat. And when you do that, you're actually bringing in birds that can actually help eat insects as well. Things like chickadees, they only feed insects to their young when they're little. And so they are collecting insects like crazy in the spring. Um, these plants are adapted to Northwest climate. Um, there are fewer problems in general. So you have less need to um, even be thinking about pesticide use. Um, Oregon grape does get powdery mildew on it and it's usually on the new growth. So um, trying not to overly fertilize plants like that um, can be helpful because the new growth um, becomes not only um, attractive for powdery mildew to grow on, but also for aphids. 
So reducing, you know, we want plants to grow, but we don't want to push them to grow too much um, because that actually will increase pest and disease issues. Um, but in general, um, Northwest natives have fewer problems. Next. So here is a, just a little love slide about Anna's hummingbirds who I love. Uh, you wanna have diverse and layered vegetation and this is good for all kinds of birds, but I mean birds, you know, a light on the tip of a twig. This picture was taken in my, at my old house uh, um, behind my house. Uh, this hummingbird was sitting on a twig on top of an apple tree in my neighbor's yard. And I was out there looking at the um, great blue herons that were nesting in the, um, the cottonwoods that were in the green space. On, this is on Northeast 95th and Sandpoint Way. They aren't there any longer. The eagles routed them out, but they were there nesting for about seven years and increasing. There were about a dozen nests there by the time they had left. Uh, but this little hummingbird was watching me and the um, big birds as I, as I was photographing them. Uh, she was sitting next to me watching what I was doing. So they uh, occupy all kinds of parts of your, um, of your um, garden. They like shrubby plants to nest in. So you may even find them in a rhododendron, for instance, they're tiny, tiny little nests. They use moss for their nests. And so people worry about moss in the yard a lot. And actually it's a really good um, product for birds to use to make nests. Uh, hummingbird nests are made from moss, lichen, and spider silk, amongst other things, but those are the predominant um, ingredients that they use. They like tubular flowers. They're very effective with their long beaks at getting up in there to get the nectar. Um, you know, putting them up at least two feet height in height, even if they're shorter plants, you can put them in tall pots, gives them access because um, they fly up to feed. They also, fly, they drink water on the fly. So a moving water feature can be useful because they will fly through it to, to um, bathe and to drink. Um, you can put up a feeder in colder months, just make sure to keep that clean um, and don't let mildew and uh, mold build up in it. And also um, in the winter, sometimes people switch them out daily if it's freezing weather or even twice a day to make sure that there's um, liquid food in it. Um, I mentioned the plants, the Oregon grape, the red flower and currant, the rosemary. Um, and as you get further into the season, there's many, many more, but tubular flowers in particular are really attractive to these guys. So next. Um, making sure you know how to plant is important. Trees and shrubs, um, as I mentioned, you don't want to have these super enriched planting holes, but you do want to add some compost to that. You want to make sure that the planting hole is not any deeper than the root ball itself. And one way you can measure this is by taking the shovel handle and you know turn your shovel upside down and put it next to the root ball and then mark on your shovel handle where the top of the root ball is. When you dig your hole, put the shovel handle in it to see if it's, you know, your line on the shovel is below or above a grade of the soil. You want it right at the same grade that it is in the pot. And as I mentioned, you don't want to have bark and mulch and um, uh, soil come up against the trunk of woody plants that can actually kill them. So making sure that they're not too deep, make the hole twice as wide as the um, root ball is and, and break it up, break up the edges, especially if you have sort of clay soil, you want to break up and sort of score the edges of the planting hole. And then you're going to um, add that backfill in and you're gonna tamp it in with your fingers or with the shovel handle to make sure there's no air pockets. Um, if the plant, when you take it out of the pot has a lot of, it's like really root bound, you need to cut that open or pry it open and spread the roots out uh, so that they will go out um, around the plant and not go in circles that can cause girdling roots, which will also kill a plant. Perennials, the same thing, they usually, some of them can be very root bound when you plant them, you need to open it up, um, but it, you wanna use the same rules of thumb with planting. Some of them don't mind being a little bit lower than grade, but uh, in general, it's better to, to start out with them being at grade and not worry about that. Vegetables, 
if you're planting this time of year, just give them space that they need to grow into the ultimate size that they're going to grow with. You can amend the soil with compost and mulch with compost, and you can add a little bit of vegetable food um, to them as you plant this fall. And then with lawns, um, lawns are a class on its own. You want to prepare the soil well. You want to avoid having compacted soil so that the lawn will drain well. Um, you can put fertilizer down first, especially well for both seeded and sod lawns. And then as you see in the picture, when you're laying sod, you want to make sure the ends are staggered so that you don't get big long seams where the, where the sod dries out. Um, it's better to have them staggered where um, you know, the shorter seam ends, and then you try to make those edges meet as best you can so that they will knit together fast. And then make sure to water these plants, as I said. You need to water the soil first, and then water, especially if you're planting anytime soon, um, and water the um, plant after you plant it. Okay, next. So for fall lawn care, it's a little warm still to fertilize the lawn, but as we get later into September, um, think about fertilizing. If you don't ever fertilize, this is the time of year to do it. Once a year fertilizing is enough for lawns if you are um, grass cycling and letting the grass um, uh, fall back down when you mow, because that grass that you're mowing is actually full of nitrogen, and so it's the same as fertilizing. You can aerate this time of year. This is a great time of year to do that. That actually helps to break the soil up underneath, especially if you top dress with compost. The compost you put on top would not bury the uh, grass. The intention is just to put a little layer. So ideally grass should be mowed at about a three inch height, which means you could put about an inch of compost down. And then that falls into those holes and it helps to break up the soil underneath. Um, soil organisms are doing this work for you. So they're actually in the soil, uh, you know, moving the nutrition around. They're, this is all organic matter that they feed off of and their activity actually is what helps to feed plants. Um, you could reseed thin areas, um, even if you don't wanna do a full aeration, you know, areas where grass is thin, it might be that that's really compacted. So maybe you put some holes in that area. And then fall is a great time to apply lime Lime is calcium. Calcium is lost with rain fall. It moves into lower levels of the soil, washes off, and calcium helps to keep our soils less acidic. In the Northwest, our soils tend to be acidic because of winter rain, and um, lime can help you manage soil pH for lawns, which, like vegetable gardens, appreciate a more alkaline soil. Okay, next. And then winterizing tips. So what you see here is a little hummingbird feeder and the little buzz of a hummingbird. You can see it's sort of flapping there in the corner. This was a very heavy snowfall again in my old yard up in Northeast Seattle. And um, I would switch those out twice a day um, so that they had liquid food. Yeah, it's just the wings are beating like crazy. Um, it was a pretty deep snow and I was helping to keep them fed because they, there wasn't much else out there. The other thing that I found happened was I use a lot of rope lights um, and I had rope lights along the walkway just to the left of that picture um, to light up the pathway because there weren't lights in the yard. And so walking up to the house, the, the rope light would, would sort of snake along the side, sidewalk and you could uh, see where you're walking. It would melt the snow. And actually I had a lot of ground feeding birds that would run up and down those channels looking for things to eat in the soil because it melted enough for them to get to the soil level. So I had a lot of bird activity because of the things I did in my yard um, in the winter and helped to feed them. Um, but it's important to think about, do you have outside faucets that need to be um, turned off or protected? If you can't turn them off, put you know insulators over them. You wanna make sure that you drain and roll up your hoses to store inside so that they're not out there with water in them, which will expand um, as it freezes into ice and it could crack your hose. Uh, you wanna do the same if you have any drip irrigation going on. Um, you certainly need to winterize and turn off automatic irrigation systems. Um, if you have soaker hoses, it's good to mulch over them and just to, that will help keep them protected for the winter. Uh, potted plants need to be uh, protected also from freezing. 
So they are much more vulnerable because they're in air level. They're not, there isn't all this insulating factor of soil around them. And they need to either have mulch on them. Sometimes if you have something tender, people put um, burlap around them or they sometimes put like bubble wrap around them and that can help your pots from freezing. But most importantly is making sure they're hydrated because a dry soil pot will freeze and that can kill your plant. Um, and because it's, um, it's not able to take up water when the soil is frozen. Um, check plants under eaves for the same reason. And then again, prepare for songbird needs if you want to um, put bird feeders out. Um, bird feeders can be rat attractors. There are ways to minimize that by having trays that sit underneath them, um, put them in sort of um, hardware cloth cages that rats can't get into if they're hanging up in trees. Uh, you know that um, only um, you, you only make holes big enough for a songbird to get into. Rats are pretty inventive. You can put baffles up on poles that will help keep them from being able to climb up to them. Um, but ideally not having seed that spills onto the ground is, is the better thing. Um, and using things like black oil sunflower seed, which has less uh, litter, so to speak. Um, but those suet feeders are actually pretty ideal for a lot of songbirds. Um, and there are ways to protect those to keep rats off of them. And then doing the hummingbird feeders. So next. So this is us. Um, our program, the Garden Hotline is a free service for uh, residents of King County, though we talk to people from anywhere. So if you are listening today and not from King County, don't be shy. We have talked to people in Africa, in China, um, all across the United States. We get a lot of calls from New York and Florida. Interestingly, Chicago, Illinois is one of those. Um, and we are sponsored by Seattle Public Utilities, the Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County, the um, Rainwise Program, and then the Cascade Water Alliance. And our goal is just to help you successfully garden in natural ways. And you know, sometimes people think that means a lot of extra work, but mostly what it means is pre-planning and you know, setting your garden up right in the first place. And fall is a great time to be thinking about all that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I can get back up that slide. I don't know what happened. Um, um, we, uh, I believe it's this weekend. We got Mercury in retrograde, so we're just rolling with it. <laughs> I'm going to uh, bring it back up just so folks can can see it. Um, oh, there is a couple questions in the chat box. Great. Um, uh, Kar uh, Karine, I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm sorry if I butchered it. <laughs> no, that's right. You got it. Oh, yay. I did say it right. Um, so you said I've noticed that uh, many rainwater projects don't apply to my area. I'm wondering if there's anything in the Des Moines area uh, to help with creating rain gardens or installing catchable systems. So, yeah, so that's where you want. Have you looked at the 12,000 uh, rain garden page yet? I did. I did. I thought. Um, I thought those were the two that I looked at that you mentioned, and it didn't seem okay. to. Okay. So on that up. page, there is a list. Uh, there are a couple things mentioned for King County that okay. are um, their money that's available to any resident in King County. So. Oh, okay, um, great. I would look at those because those are coming from the you know the storm water, wastewater folks at King County. They ha they have funding to help people do projects in their gardens. Um, I don't know if Des Moines has something specific for the city, you could find it on the city page or it would be on that page, but I'm not familiar with something directly from there. Um, I can look while we're talking. Um, yeah, but that think... King, the King County grants are the ones that are probably most okay. pertinent. Okay, I'll take a look back there again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and um, I have a bunch of links um, that you had sent me in the past, Laura, that um, I can um, enter in the chat box and also on the live stream for those of you that are watching live with us.
So um, I'm going to stop this screen because most of the information I'll be sharing has this screen. So we'll stop that. Any question? Any more questions while I'm uh, prepping this other information? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, uh, enter um, your questions in the chat box. So here's two um, for King County. One's called GSI mini grants up to 1500 per project or 4500 per project for income limited nonprofit. I think that's the uh, higher amount. Salmon friendly um, in unincorporated King County as well as Woodenville and Covington and then unincorporated King County Rainscape. So that GSI mini grant for people living in cities in King County is probably the place to go to look uh, to see what you would be eligible for. Okay, what was the last one you said? Um, uh, the last one is an unincorporated King County as a Rainscapes. Oh. Um, okay. Helps cover construction maintenance costs and provides technical support. So I guess, you know, they just have to define whether you're in um, unincorporated King County or in a city in King County will make the difference as to which is people are eligible for. And I don't Thank see, you. I don't see anything else. Yeah. Tacoma Thank has, you for looking that up. Laura is amazing. Um, every time I get to work with her, I always get inspired and learn so much. And I'm so grateful for everyone being here and tuning in with us. Really appreciate you. This was really great. Lots of really wonderful information. Thank you. I was wondering, I, I, maybe you said this at the beginning, but is there, will you be sending out like um, a link to the recording or I oh, took yes. notes, but I'm just wondering if there's another way to get some of the notes. <laughs> Oh, yes, definitely. So um, uh, we are streaming live to Facebook on our um, Federal Way Marlene's page and um, um, with uh, with that, we will also be um, posting it to our YouTube channel and I can definitely um, post the link here um, in the chat box for those of you that are interested in also seeing some other wonderful classes that Laura and the um, Garden Hotline uh, crew have done um, this year. We are just super grateful, Laura, to be in partnership with you and Garden Hotline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been fun. And the links that are going up now that, uh, that Elizabeth is putting into the chat box, if you go to the Heart Garden Hotline page too directly, just go to the homepage, You'll see up in the top menu, Garden Hot, I think it says resources. Um, and what those are, a bunch of fact sheets. So the first fact sheet she posted is one that lives there. Um, but there's lots of different things. The soil resources is a really important one for this time of year that she's just put in there. Um, Bird-friendly plantings, those are ideas of plants that you want to um, plant that you could be looking for at nurseries right now. Um, Oh yeah, and also taste the flowers is about edible plants, but edible flowers that you can eat, but any of those are beneficial, good for beneficial insects. Um, and then there's the beneficial insect sheet. So a lot of those have plant list suggestions, lots of ideas to think about to add to the yard. Um, one of the things I wanna say too, is that when you plant, when you grow vegetables, and since we're at Tilt Alliance, we talk to people about food all the time. Um, when you plant them and you grow them in your yard, you people tend to have like their veggie bed and then their flower garden, mix it up. It's good to have flowers mixed into the vegetable garden because the closer they are to, especially to the things that you want to get pollinated, the easier it is for to have your plants pollinated. So think about being more um, sort of diverse in your plantings. That's always a better um, arrangement. That's very smart because it it doesn't give the weeds room to grow. That too, it's absolutely. The more you have covering the soil, the less weed growth you're going to have. Yay! That is. Oh, I never. When you when you go hiking in the woods, you know you see all the native plants. Where you encounter places where there's a lot of weeds, 
and you can, this could happen like in the middle of the forest. Like um, when I was studying botany years ago at UW, we did some hikes up in Tiger Mountain and um, Cougar Mountain. And we were looking at um, how the landscape changed and found areas where there had been a fire or a blowdown. Um, something had happened to disturb the landscape and then the weeds came in. And so otherwise areas around them were pristine with, you know, native plants. Um, some, some weeds are really aggressive and will grow anyway, but it typically they are looking for openings uh, in a canopy or openings in the, in the ground. Um, so after, you know, fires, volcanic eruptions, things like that is when we are more vulnerable to that. And also forest edges where the forest meets urban areas, you see a lot of weeds and native and weedy plants, things like butterfly bush, which is a terribly invasive plant. Um, you see those oh, on the yeah. forest edges. Yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, I was, um, yeah, and you always see like um, scotch broom, like on the yeah. highways too. Yes, right, where they mow. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and they have these grassy areas and the scotch broom invades. Scotch broom is a colonizer. So it's one of the first plants that will come in after disturbance. And that's, you know, why it's so successful. Um, they are, you know, they don't have, they don't have totally bad features. They actually fix nitrogen in the soil but they're terribly invasive. And the problem is they don't leave room for our native plants to grow. That should be there. Um, and that our native uh, fauna depend on. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite amazing how nature just kind of knows what to do. And it's, it's always so fascinating learning about all that. Oh, yes. And um, you have your October 15th class on putting the garden to bed for the winter. Yes, wonderful. Oh, and um, gosh, I don't have my calendar book on me for the December date for the um, holiday wreath class. I think it's either the third or the 10th. I think but... we decided on the 10th. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. It was the 10th. Yeah. yeah. So um, folks, keep an eye out on our website for that. And um, I'll be putting up the October class here soon um, as a little early boost. And putting the garden to bed will uncover some of the stuff we talked about today, but in more detail, and in particular, talk a lot about vegetable gardens. Um, so if you're a veggie garden grower, uh, we'll go into more depth about how to, um, you know, what to be doing in the garden, how to protect everything, what to be growing, um, more detail about the cover crops, all of that. And um, the wreath class too will be, you know, mostly fun in, you know, learning how to make wreaths or swags, that kind of thing. But we'll be talking about evergreen plants and how important they are in the landscape as well. It'll be a, a, a fun and educational class as always. Yay. Yay. Well, any more questions, folks? I'm gonna check the, the live stream um, chat here, see if we got any questions. Okay, I don't think we have any here. Any questions, folks? Don't be shy. All right. Well, well you know where to call if you have them. Call yes. the hotline. Who are you going to call? Garden hotline. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you tuning in this wonderful morning and take good care. And thank you again, Lori. You're a wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Everyone take good care. <laughs>